Good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy Arnson. I'm director of the Latin American program. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's event on El Salvador. In a little over two weeks, Salvadorans will go to the polls to elect 84 members of the Legislative Assembly and 262 mayors. The party of President Nayib Bukele, Nuevas Ideas or New Ideas currently leads in the polls. President Bukele is a former mayor of San Salvador and he won the, two, the 2019 presidential elections with 53% of the vote. He ran as an outsider, campaigned via social media and attacked the country's two dominant political parties, ARENA on the right, the FMLN on the left, for failing in years of time in office to curb corruption, rein in the rampant violence by gangs, or create economic opp opportunity for the majority of Salvadorans who are young people. President Bukele enjoys some of the highest popularity ratings of any president in Latin America, at times reaching as high as 90% but his governing tactics have raised alarm in El Salvador, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, last February, he sent our, the armed forces into the legislature to force and coerce a vote on security spending. He has ignored Supreme Court rulings, challenging the government's harsh COVID-19 crackdown. And he has harassed independent media, human rights groups and others in civil society. That led scores of opposition politicians, members of the Catholic Church, private sector leaders, civil society organizations, including people represented on today's webinar, uh, to issue a statement last month criticizing Bukele's, quote, persistent efforts to erode our democratic order, unquote. And just yesterday, members of the legislature initiated a process to remove Bukele from office just two weeks before the midterm elections. The Bukele government has fought back. Salvadoran Foreign Minister Alexandra Hill recently accused members of El Salvador's, quote, corrupt establishment, unquote, of imposing their will on local institutions as well as in Washington. She said that discredited elites are attempting to pervert President Bukele's efforts, policies, and leadership into a twisted illusion on emerging authoritarianism. So what do the upcoming elections tell us about El Salvador's political future? Is Bukele the young hipster would-be authoritarian as his critics charge? And are his critics ignoring their own failings to resolve El Salvador's chronic problems during their decades in office? We're privileged to have an extraordinary group of Salvadorans and US experts to reflect on these questions, as well as on the future of US Salvadoran relations. Claudia Umania is vice president of the Salvadoran Foundation for Economic and Social Development, FUSADES, a leading think tank in El Salvador. Sarah Maslin is currently the Brazil correspondent for The Economist and spent years in El Salvador as a researcher and a stringer for The Economist. Francisco de Sola is a leading member of the private sector and former chairman of the de Sola Group. Ruben Zamora, a former Salvadoran ambassador to the United States, the United Nations, India, and also a former president of El Salvador's Legislative Assembly. Milena Mayorga, is um, El Salvador's current ambassador to Washington and a former member of the Salvadoran legislature who split from the ARENA party. And last but not least, Mari Carmen Aponte is the former US ambassador to El Salvador during the Obama administration. Thank you very much for joining us. There will be an opportunity to ask questions following these opening presentations. Please send your, your questions to our Twitter account at Lat Am Prog, L A T A M P R O G. Thank you. Claudia, please go ahead. Thank you, Wilson Center and Cynthia, for creating this space to, create, to talk about El Salvador, a country at a turning point. I will answer three questions with my comments. One, why are we at this turning point? Two, why are the congressional elections so important? And three, what are the opportunities? 
The checks and balances that have sustained our republic are being dangerously eroded. We have major concerns, which is that President Bukele is using the tools of democracy to destroy democracy with his increasing authoritarian pattern. His administration systematically undermines the rule of law, threatens the separation of powers, and there is no commitment with accountability and transparency. We need to keep rule of law, not the rule of fear of a strong man. The Salvadoran democratic institutions are in general well-designed, but their performance have not met the level of expectations of a modern society, especially the younger generations and we can never take democracy for granted. Since the signing of the peace accords, we have had the opportunity to experience civil liberties and more stability in relation to other countries in the region. But we have been battling with, with very serious problems like gang-related violence, corruption, inequality, lack of education and migration. We also need to recognize that we have had advances in free elections, freedom of speech, access to information, a political armed forces, and an independent constitutional court. But trust in the traditional parties has eroded. President Bukele ran to office claiming he would combat corruption and promise change while he capitalized the corruption scandals. No one has been as successful as President Nayib Bukele in harnessing the potential of social media. Basically, he has used Twitter as his government communication platform, inflammatory comments and even firing public officials to Twitter was normalized. The president put into place a new narrative that is changing civic values and reinterpreting history while he becomes the hero and the traditional parties the enemy. It's a zero sum game and the winner takes it all. At the beginning of his mandate, many people gave him the benefit of the doubt. But a year ago on February the 9th, there was an inflection point with the militarization of our Congress to intimidate and force legislators to vote for a loan for his security plan. To put this in perspective, it's very similar to what happened in the US Capitol on January the 6th with the rioters. The difference was that our Congress was overtaken by our president with the assistance of heavily armed forces. The COVID-19 pandemic helped accelerate his authoritarian conduct. He has ruled by executive orders outside the legal framework, invading the legislative powers and being defiant with the constitutional chamber rulings. During this time, the government received the approval of high amounts of public funds, nearly 4 billion for the pandemic. The oversight committee created by Congress reported that government had not given sufficient information. In spite of many obstacles, the National Audit Court issued a preliminary report with irregular findings. Independent media have published investigations related to possible corruption cases in the, in the uh, managing of COVID funds and contracts. The government's reaction has been to attack media outlets and even promote hate speech with his followers. Freedom of expression and press are under attack. So why are we at a turning point? On the, eight, on the 28th of this month, Congressional elections could create a new political map. The electoral environment is excessively aggressive, even more after the killing of two activists of the FMLN party, a case currently under investigation. There is an unlevel playing field that favors the official party. On one side, the president is carrying out an extremely well-funded an organized campaign using government resources with no accountability. And in the other side, the opposition parties have not received public contributions for funding their political parties campaigns, which is their legal right. So my second question is, why are these elections so important? Because by June, the newly elected Congress will appoint five Supreme Court justices. And in less than six months after that, the next attorney general who will need all the support he can get to fight 
crime and corruption. And the third question, so what are the opportunities here? Having expressed the concerns that are disrupting our democracy, we appreciate that bipartisan letters of US Congress representatives regarding many of these issues. With the new Biden administration, comprehensive vision through a multi-pronged approach, we can strengthen democratic governance and advance the rule of law. I believe El Salvador has precious time in the following months to take a better path. As President Biden said last week in his speech at the State Department, defending freedom, championing opportunities, upholding universal rights, respecting the rule of law, and treating every person with dignity. It's an interesting time because civil society in El Salvador has come together joined by democratic values, and we will stand together to collaborate on this pursuit. But that divisive actions of government need to stop. Wounds have to heal so that we can generate trust again. Achieving lives with dignity and creating the dream of prosperity in our countries is our priority. I thank the Wilson Center for the opportunity to share ideas and in one year we can convene again to evaluate if democracy withered or if it was restored. Thank you. Uh, Claudia, thank you and uh, Sarah, you're next. Great. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much to to Cynthia and to the Wilson Center for inviting me. It's, it's really an honor to be part of this panel. Um, although it's always bittersweet for me to talk about El Salvador because I miss it so much and I'm currently 4,000 miles away in Brazil. Um, it's a good thing that we're do doing this panel in, in English so no one can see the damage that Portuguese has done to my Spanish. Um, well, I wanted to start in, in El Mozote in January of 2015. Uh, so lately, El Mozote has been in the news a lot, but six years ago, it really wasn't. I was going there uh, because I was a history student and then a journalist and became fascinated by the town and everything it has been through. But people found it kind of strange that an American student was interested in, in speaking to them and hearing about their stories because so many people in El Salvador hadn't been for so many years. So in January 2015, three decades after soldiers from the Salvadoran army killed nearly a thousand civilians in the village and surrounding hamlets, and two decades after the war ended and survivors started moving back, El Mosote had become a quiet and peaceful place. It was still dependent on subsistence farming and was struggling with many of the same problems that much of El Salvador faced then and is still facing now. Poverty, lack of development and opportunity, fragmented families after the war, and still now because of violence. But El Salvador at that point had mostly been spared of the gang violence that was spreading in the cities and really dominating the lives of so many people. So it was really shocking when one day, People woke up to fresh graffiti on the wall of a house near the plaza. It said, ver, oír y callar, which anyone who has been to El Salvador knows is a gang tag that means see, hear, and shut up. This would have been worrying for any rural town that had hoped to be shielded from the gangs. I've heard stories like this from many, many places. But in El Mosote, where in 1981, soldiers from the Atlacat Battalion scrawled on the very same walls. It was a reminder of how far from what people had hoped would come after the war El Salvador was in 2015. And in fact, it felt like a step backward. Mark Danner, a journalist from The New Yorker who, who visited El Mosote in the 90s, wrote about the town as a parable of the Cold War. And I think it has become a kind of parable of, of El Salvador's flawed peace. Claudia has, has told us about the high hopes for post-war El Salvador and the fact that the democratic institutions were really well designed. But by 2015 and, and certainly by 2017, at the 25th anniversary of El Salvador's peace accords, people had stopped citing it as a model. 
the UN actually had to send an envoy to try to broker peace between the government and the gangs and between two polarized political parties, the FMLN and ARENA, who were of course descendants of the two sides during the war. Their gridlock was preventing Congress from any meaningful actions to address fiscal problems and try to boost economic growth. And you know, perhaps the thing that people cared about the most, uh, corruption allegations, which had tainted both of them. At that point, ex-president Mauricio Funes from the FMLN had fled to Nicaragua amid corruption allegations and Tony Saka from Arena was in jail after embezzling what we now know is hundreds of millions of dollars. El Salvador was the most violent country in the Americas and 40% of people that year in, in 2017 told pollsters from the Central American University that they wanted to leave the country within a year, the highest rate since the UCA started asking that question a decade earlier. So there were of course some positive things. Health and education spending had been boosted under the FMLN and the very fact that corruption came to light speaks to improvements in the justice system, which both parties helped pass into law. The, the famous constitutional chamber of the Supreme Court had important progressive rulings, including striking down the amnesty law, which paved the way to reopening the Mosote case. But these kinds of incremental steps often serve to highlight just how much is still lacking. And we've seen across Latin America, including here in Brazil, where I live, that when anti-corruption investigations finally start to land politicians in jail, often the public's perceptions of corruptions go up, not down. And that was the message people sent at legislative elections in 2018, in which one in 10 voters defaced their ballots and a record 58% stayed home. So into this scenario comes Nayib Bukele. Um, I wanted to highlight just a few things about him, which most people here will already know. Um, but first, even though he originally rose in the FMLN, he was very successful at painting himself as an outsider. A part of this is because he's young. He was born the same year as the El Mosote massacre and entered politics many years after the war. The fights that he started within the FMLN got him kicked out in 2017, but won him plenty of admirers. He's a very skilled communicator and he figured out social media before anyone else did. Everyone in El Salvador knew, for example, that the young mayor of San Salvador was doing una obra por dia or one project every day and that he'd reformed the historical center of the city. I actually have my own experience with this. The story that I wrote about the legislative elections in 2018 was about people's disillusion with the FMLN and ARENA and about the rise of Naib. It said at the very end, a sentence like, if the election were today, Naib would probably win. On social media, this very quickly became, the economist endorses Naib Bukele. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about this kind of um, fake news and, and disinformation and, and how that has influenced people's perceptions in the past couple of years. So in an era of populist politicians capitalizing on anger with politics as usual, it's not hard to see why he won. He even got a significant share of votes in El Mosote, an FMLN stronghold, even though the FMLN, uh, the FMLN did get the majority in, in 2019. So I, I'll leave it to the other panelists to talk more about, about the past two years uh, because I've mostly been following from afar. But I did just want to end with the recent speech in El Mosote where he called the peace accords a farce. I've heard from friends in El Mosote in, in the week since that these comments didn't go over very well among older people and especially victims of the massacre. But there's also a younger contingent in El Mosote and certainly in El Salvador who didn't live through the war and whose dominant feeling about the peace accords is not one of hope and relief for what they were marking an end to, but frustration, frustration about everything that has followed. And I think that a lot of that feeling came from long before Naib Bukele, and we can look to the other parties and politicians as well for blame, uh, but he has really been remarkable in how he has capitalized on it. Um, I think what happens in the elections coming up will be really telling uh, about the degree to which Salvadorans have lost faith, not just in the traditional parties, but also I would argue in the democratic, democratic foundations and institutions of El Salvador. 
Thanks very much. Tara, thank you. I'd like to remind our audience, um, if you have a question, please submit it to our Twitter account at LATAMPROG. Uh, Francisco de Sola, over to you. Good morning. Oops, sorry. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and um, thank you for my predecessors. I think you've painted a very objective view of different sides of this story. I'm asked to speak about economy and I shall do so briefly, dramatically, because the situation unfortunately is not good. This is a, a result of a very serious pandemic and also unfortunately uh, due to some of the inconsistencies in our economic uh, results and also deficiencies in the administration. To start with, our economy has contracted 8.6 or 9%, which is very serious. This has resulted in about 118,000 jobs lost, which is a lot for this country. That includes the informal sector. Uh, about 2,200 businesses have shut down, they've stopped paying salaries, and perhaps the most telling and worrisome data, by the way, the data is from universities, from FUSADES, from the social security system and other government agencies. So they are hard data. But the most difficult data perhaps is that about 1.9 million people have now receded into poverty. Apparently, we are now at 41% coming from 31% of our population suffering poverty. And of course, the poorest are the ones who suffer the most. Another difficult data is that about 450,000 more people are said to be at serious risk of sinking in poverty. On a positive note, there have to be some positive notes, Salvadorans abroad have shown great solidarity with their country. Remittances have increased to 23% of GDP, and now we have achieved almost $6 billion of remittances. And this helps, of course, to balance the, the current account of the country. Exports, however, this has to do a lot with deficiencies in the administration, have sank, sunk 17%. That's $1 billion less of revenue, which is very important. It's the worst, worst situation in Central America in 80 years. Sharp contrast to our neighbors who have achieved increases in their exports. Foreign investment has decreased almost $500 million for the year, 2020. And of course, tax revenue is down $4.5 billion which is $200 million more than was budgeted. Another very difficult data is that total debt in the country is now $3 billion higher. And we are now at 9% of GDP, which is unsustainable. So quickly, in conclusions, which I hope will be taken as objective, we have a very difficult debt situation. There are serious unfunded pension liabilities. There will be higher interest costs because there's a credit crunch coming in the world. There are serious administrative deficiencies in execution, certainly in lack of transparency as Claudia has so well explained. There is a budget problem between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And of course, controls have gone out the window. To make matters difficult, Moody's has now reduced our rating to B3. And one must ask if we really have the cash flow as a country to be able to face these debts, put our house in order, and start a process of fiscal reasoning, common sense, to put us back on the, on the track we need. The adjustments we know will be painful. There will be taxes, there will be cutting of expenses, there will be freezing of wages. There will be a return to transparency. A lot of things with the International Monetary Fund would certainly ask for, but apparently they're not being asked to come and help us out. 
So I'd like to just close by sculpting two scenarios of what might happen with the coming election. One, which looks, looks quite clear is that the president and his party and his allies will find newfound power by gaining a majority, perhaps a controlling majority in the legislative assembly, which will allow him to impose his agenda. But that will mean from all the records we have and the actions that he's taken, that this will mean more borrowings, more populist handouts, possibly even a change in the constitution. This will be in an autocratic bent, which is his way of doing things, and it bodes ill for the economy. He might seek a deal with private enterprise in order to have allies in creating jobs and investment. But as they say, once bitten, twice shy, private enterprise is not buying confidence in the president yet. It will result in a worsening economic situation, serious additional threats to institutionality, freedom of the press, and possibly more deterioration of government. Another scenario, which seems to look difficult, is that the opposition manages to hold on to an influential position in the Legislative Assembly and also in the mayoral elections. This will put us into a dilemma which will call on Salvadorans to be mature. And that would be take a divided country which cannot really deal the two factions, the government against the opposition into a scenario of deal making where the creation of a consensus will make us rally around a united view of a future of the country which theoretically should point us in the direction of a saner economy and growth and prosperity. This would mean, if achievable, fiscal common sense, a return to transparency and better governance, and strengthening institutions which have been debilitated, which will control corruption and point us in the, in the area of job creation. Those are two scenarios. Certainly, they will have variations. And if I have a chance later on, Cynthia, I would like to comment on a positive view of where we should point the country uh, in a scenario of a more positive future. Thank you. Francisco, thank you. Uh, Ruben Zamora, if you could unmute yourself. Mitch, here you go. Hello to everybody. Um, good afternoon. And what I want to say in my few minutes is to try to see what kind of government we have in El Salvador now. It's not like the previous, it's a different one. But this government started to one year, a little bit more than one year, with a crisis in the country. But it was three crises. Economic, the economy had been stunned without growing beyond 2% in the last 30 years, social exclusion, too much exclusion in my country. And I think that the phenomenon of migration is one a big indicator of that. A fairly political crisis. That is that the political system and especially the political parties and the National Assembly have been losing a lot of their capacity to represent the people. That was the, the scenario. There came a new government that won in the first, in the first uh, part of the election, you know, and that means a lot of popular support. And along this year, we have discovered what is the, the real problem for the government of President Bukele. I think the problem is, is the question of the democracy is based on a representative government. That means the man and all the men and men or women that are the government do not own the government. They represent the people because the people is the, the, the owner 
of the government. Yeah. But here is a big problem with the present government that instead of respecting mm, our representation, that means being uh, in, in government by the elections of the people, that is already done, yes. But secondly, is being subject to a constitution and laws in the country. And he cannot do anything in the government, starting from the president, to break the constitution or the laws. And thirdly, he has to respond to the people for the thing that they are doing. These two basic characteristics of the representation in a democracy are the one that now has been destroyed in our country. What comes from that? I think that many consequences. First, I will say that the president or, or, or the person in the press, in this case, President Bukel, believes that he is not the, repre the, the representative of the people, but he is the incarnation of the people. That means what he thinks, what he wants, is supposed by definition, because he's the president, that is the will and is what the whole, the whole people will do. Here, there is the, the problem. Because from that conception of how to govern a country come terrible conclusion. One first is that the law, starting with the constitution, is not on top of the president, is behind the president. Because if he is the people, then he has the right to move the constitution, not to obey that he is with the right for secondary lesson, let laws to not to accept that. First consequence. Second consequence, I see that the president consider the incarnation of the people and therefore tend to centralize terribly all the manage of the, governor, the governance in the country. He ordered the, the minister with tweeters at any time. He tried to control everything. Control the minister, try to destroy if he cannot control the tribunal, constitutional tribunal, the body that in El Salvador controls how the government is using the money, yes, and the legislative organ, because he's the one who produced the laws. In that sense, then, we become more and more to an extra centralized government that now is reflected in the campaign of the official party. You know, the campaign in the, the, the TV and in the radio is made by the only person that in the country cannot be the, the candidate, the president of the republic. Using the figure and the name of the president, the first name, Najib, for saying that people has to vote for that letter N, that is the beginning of the name of the president, and saying that has to vote for the president. You see, that is the, 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 the way that we are living now in El Salvador, yeah? And in that sense then, as well, there is another, another consequence, yeah? That is that he is above the law. And this has been the biggest problem. That's why there are so many problems between the, pre the government and the, uh, uh, and, and the constitutional is the, is institute that we have uh, that look for the constitution and constantly, and he is attacking them constantly once and again. And now with the attorney general of the Republic, because he had started to investigate a crime in which two people were killed another were wounded and they started to attack them. In, the, in that sense then, yes, the law started to be destroyed and the people inside the government started to learn that lesson and start to play with the laws and forget the laws. Another thing is that 
the, the impact in the bureaucracy of the country. In a democracy, the bureaucracy has to be honest, has to be by merit, and be what the law say. Now, the main argument for putting somebody in the government is the loyalty to the president, not to the constitution, to the president, you see? And that is the, the open up hmm? the door for corruption, easier than if you have the other alternative for the bureaucracy. And another situation is that we have to recognize that the president has a, a strong support for the people from the population. It's, come, it's going down slowly, but it's going down in this last, especially in the last eight months, according to the, the, to, to the consultation by, by the people, yeah? But then the, the government tend to, to, to go in supporting itself more and more in the police and the armed forces. This is the story of Venezuela. This is the story of Nicaragua. And this is what is being repeated in El Salvador now, that more and more the government depend, the government deal to buy the, the, the highest level of the arm and the police and control to them all the things. And finally, I want to say another one that, and that this is amusing. We are free, with a government that is using a different language, the language of the social networks. That the area that is more difficult to control by the law. In fact, that they have very little laws to control it. Yeah. And this is where they, they go and they try to, to, to have support for the people and maintain through say, saying a lot of lies a lot of bad things. That's why in conclusion, it seems to me that in El Salvador, the center of his political crisis now is the democratic institutionality. This is the one who is being destroyed. And if we destroy the institutional democracy in any country, no matter how weak he was or how he was growing very slowly, but if it is destroyed, then the only alternative for the country is dictatorship. And that is our point. And that's why we are talking to all of you, because we need to stop that, to move, not to, to get rid of the president. This is not possible. Could it that is the same thing with another name? No, but to move from this characteristic that I show to a more open, a more open to hear other people and, and to a way to try to unite the country and the population and not to destroy it. Thank you. Ruben, thank you very much. We'll now hear from Ambassador Mayorga. Um, Ambassador, I, I realize that you're not going to be able to stay um, during the question and answer uh, program, but I'll just mention one question that's come in for you. Uh, which has to do with how the constitutional reform process that's being led by the vice president, um, how is that shaping up? What are What is the scope of reforms um, that are being contemplated? So I'll just put that on the table. We invite your remarks. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank the Wilson Center for allowing me to participate in today's panel. The topic of the Constitution, I think we should discuss it in another uh, time. I am still a member of the Congress of El Salvador. El Salvador's legislative body um, have a clearance to act as the ambassador to the U.S. This is very important. I resigned the previous political party of which I was a member due to the clear systemic corruption that I later came to know was endemic to the party. Also, I suffered 43 episodes of political violence and I never sought help. Why? Because the system is corrupt and dominated by the, the traditional party. This is an attempt to undermine women's participation. 
Now women are more involved in our country's politics. And I have been the first to endorse young women getting involved in politics for the first time. Also, I was the most voted assembly member as a newcomer in an election. And even since that campaign, I have always said I will do what is fair and what is right. I have always strived to construct bridges to achieve good governance. Everyone here knows that the previous model of governance consisted of the executive branch simply bribing the legislative branch through shady deals using secret ledgers. This illegal and corrupt way of buying and selling influence is over. The civil war caused the death of more than 80,000 Salvadorans. The post-war era prompted a second war, a war of a social nature, started by criminal gangs. This second war has brought about the violent death of more than 100,000 Salvadorans. Furthermore, this second war triggered the migration of three quarters of our population, severely impacted the social fabric of our society. Over the last 30 years, our diaspora settled here in the United States, in Canada, and in other countries. Its members have spent nearly $100 billion in remittances back to El Salvador. Nevertheless, the conditions that have caused Salvadorans to live are finally changing under this government. The Bukele government implemented a territorial control plan, which aims to decrease violence in El Salvador and provide safety for its citizens. A government controls its territory when it builds a school. A government controls its territory when it provides a quality health system to its citizens. A government controls its territory when the penitentiary system is under check. President Bukele's territorial control plan has allowed this. I would like to remind you again that I am a member of the Legislative Assembly. And originally from a party that now opposes President Bukele. When it came to legislating on behalf of the citizens, they could always count on me. I was there on February 9th, 2020, and can attest that our rule of law was not infringed, much less the strength of our democracy. Our justice system, with all its flaws, sent several resolutions which have been followed completely, even when the government had been left without the proper means to protect its citizens from the COVID-19 pandemic. In January 2020, we activated protocols to prepare ourselves for the pandemic. We were the first country in Latin America to do it. And in March, I witnessed for myself a strong resistance in the legislative assembly to adopt the measures that set up by President Bukele. The government implemented measures very similar to the ones that the Biden administration is executing to contain the pandemic in the US. And we are already beginning to see positive results. Thanks to President Bukele, violent crime has plummeted. Gun violence and drug trafficking are being controlled for the first time. Critical prison reforms are being implemented and investment in much needed law enforcement system is meaningfully improving life for the Salvadoran people and others in the root causes of migration. An example of this is the 48.6 drop in homicide. And also 35% reduction in missing persons. 35% uh, reduction in extortion. The data source is the technical group crime. Public investment is also on the rise, specifically in green technology, sustainable energy, and infrastructure development. My country's roads, ports, hospitals, bridges, tunnels, and airports are being improved and updated after decades of neglect. It's now no wonder why President Bukele enjoys, enjoys such high approval ratings, both at home and abroad. For the cynics who may dismiss cosmetic approval numbers as artificial, 
I would encourage you or anybody living here in, the, in Washington or New York or Los Angeles or Houston to ask a Salvadoran what they think of President Bukele. Ours is a citizen's government. And since January, 17 different polls have rated President Bukele with 96% approval. Yesterday's event in the National Assembly are blatant acts of desperation and a resistance to change. Considering that today's panel discussion is about the risk to El Salvador's democracy, I believe it is important to recognize the events carried out yesterday against the rightfully elected president of El Salvador at the recommendation of ex-president Mauricio Funes the opposition parties, ARENA, FMLN, and PDC, began to implement a parliamentary coup d'etat against President Bukele, the Salvadoran director of police and the minister of defense. This action was taken against a president who has earned broad popularity among a strong majority of Salvadorans. And just weeks before a national legislative election, that allows the voice of the Salvadoran people to be heard. The members of the National Assembly who have taken this action are attempting to prevent suspending this bid in the upcoming election on unlawfully remove President Bukele. The principle of Western democracy demands condemnation of this action from El Salvador allies in the hemisphere and around the globe and the members of this panel. Our nation will hear the will of the people during the upcoming national legislative election later this month on February 20th. We understand that the voice of the people must not only be heard, but respected. In light of yesterday's event, I will be unable to participate in this reminder of today's discussion. My attention and energies must be urgently directed to supporting the Bukele's government and are required by my constitutional oath. I thank the Wilson Center and my fellow panelists to allow me to give these remarks and will continue to proudly represent the Bukele government here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mayorga. Um, we were having some difficulties with the audio. Um, if there would be a chance later uh, to receive a, a written copy of your remarks, we'll be more than happy to post that on our website so that the audience can uh, can consult your your very important remarks. Thank you again. Thank okay. You, Thank you. Will have you will have my, my words said today. Wonderful. We'll upload those to the web so people who are listening can consult them. Um, Ambassador uh, Aponte, you're the cleanup hitter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy, for the opportunity to address the audience of the Wilson Center. And it is wonderful to see friends from El Salvador participating here today. I am uh, going to uh, address the issue of uh, the American policy specifically, where the Biden policy is, is headed uh, during the US administration. What are some of their focuses and what are some of the concerns? I, I'd like to start by, by talking about the, the context of this all, which is, that the Salvadorian community here is immense. It is a third of the Salvadorians who live in the United States. And as Francisco mentioned, who are very generous with their uh, compatriots and send about 23% of the economy in El Salvador comes from uh, the, the remittances from the Salvadorians in the US. So. Uh, where, where this takes us is to two communities that are very close and, and where repercussions uh, are felt very uh, quickly and very intensely from, from either side. In general, the El Salvador and the United States have been friends and allies for decades, uh, from the signing of the Inter-American 
a charter in early 2000 to the, that talked about the duty to protect democracy and to protect democratic culture um, to development. Um, now, uh, at the beginning, 20 years ago, the American um, development that went to El Salvador was mostly uh, in the form of free trade. Um, and uh, of course, the salient agreement was the CAFTA DR signed in 2005, and which has helped and has changed some of the relationship between uh, not only El Salvador, but Central America and, and the US. However, that was not the only um, issue uh, in which the United States worked on. In the last 15 years, we've seen work on other um, very important democratic development, such as access to public information, which Claudia talked about, and I think that, is, that was one of a very, very important development in transparency in, in El Salvador to improvement of tax collection, to support for the Office of Attorney General, um, an asset forfeiture law. In the last four years, however, the immigration took center stage. And unfortunately, there was some backsliding um, by neglecting of a number of programs that were important to the strengthening of, of democracy. What we're seeing now under Biden is a new, clear um, policy direction, which is different and it's broader. The emphasis, yes, it's on, it's on development, but it's tied to progress in such other areas as corruption, especially corruption. Very, a few days ago, Juan Gonzalez uh, uh, from the White House gave very clear signals by, in his comment, which went something to the effect of uh, a leader who isn't ready to fight corruption will not be an ally of the United States. There's no confusing this message. Um, the point is consonant with Biden's work in Central America when he was vice president. It was, it is about accountability, it is, a, it is about transparency, and it has to be in long lasting permanent changes. Clearly, there is a pivot to a much stronger message. Um, we have uh, seen already a, a focus of, uh, of work. Uh, on his first day in office, Biden sent to Congress the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, which included a four-year plan a, and for, uh, costing with about $4 billion in resources, aiming at decreasing violence poverty and corruption in the and corruption in the Northern Triangle. Of course, El Salvador is an important component of that. It establishes also centers um, for uh, to, to process people who may have a refugee claim, not only into the United States, but also into other Congress. Add to this, and this is the most exciting news, I think, is the congressional voices that are being added in, uh, in support of democracy, in support of transparency, accountability, and, and in support of uh, making sure that the anti-corruption me message is not missed. Voices like Norma Torres, like Senator Menendez, Senator Rubio, Patrick Leahy, they are all sending the, the very same message. This is not only about development, and if there is development, it has to be tied to progress in other areas, such as 
anti-corruption and such as transparency and strengthening of democratic institutions. Another uh, promising um, tool is the newly um, legislated Engel List, which uh, uh, acknowledges uh, and, and really faces the reality that in order to make long-term sustained programs in the Northern Triangle, there has to be a commitment from regional leaders to democracy and transparency and accountability. The bill requires publication by the U.S. government of a list of individuals from these countries, of course, including El Salvador, who are engaged in significant corruption and the undermining of democratic institutions and ensure that they are not go that they will be denied entry visas into the United States. The public aspect of this uh, law is really very important and I think it's, it, it, it's going to make headway uh, in this area. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about some of the concerns that I have and some of the concerns that I have heard are important when you look at the whole um, of, of government approach and the whole uh, of go, uh, the whole approach to, to su the support of democracy. The U.S. Citizenship Act that was introduced on day one of the Biden administration is only for three years. The, this is a great beginning, but I think we need to be realistic in understanding that to implement a sustainable solution to the root causes of immigration is probably going to take more than four years, and it's probably going to cost more than $4 billion. So we need to be um, aware of that, and, and we need to be um, talking about it. And of course, I think in the Congress there is an appreciation of this, um, but this is something that uh, we need to watch. I think we need to broaden alliances in the region. We need to include Mexico, we need to include Canada, and, and even other international willing partners in investing in Central America. And we need to amplify and make sure there is not only government investment of their own resources and their own energy, but also private sector investment. There will be some expected and unexpected uh, challenges. For example, there will be some unexpected uh, internal challenges uh, here in the U.S., especially from the judiciary. As, as we have seen um, a, a judge in Texas uh, lifting the pause in deportations that Biden ordered, in his first days in office, and we need to be ready and we need to be able to deal with them. In El Salvador, eh, as we heard, also heard earlier in the program, uh, I think Claudia and Sarah may have mentioned it, that legislators in El Salvador are moving to disqualify or to I don't want to use the word impeach because I don't think that is how it's uh, couched in their constitution, but the equivalent of taking him out of office based on, the, on a disqualification of mental incapacity. I think that a lot of care has to be exercised in order for something like this to, to work, to be credible. And, and, and to not make a mockery out of the system. Um, there may be ways of doing this, but two weeks before an election does not seem to me to be the way, the prudent way in which to, to handle this. Um, the, the other uh, big concern uh, that I hear and that I have is China. 
uh, when uh, El Salvador established uh, diplomatic relations with China in, uh, in a, about 2018, China was positioning itself as the ally of choice for El Salvador. Um, and immediately started with an outsized uh, project that included, included expanding a hardly used outside, uh, a project, a port in, in La Union. Um, the legislature stopped this uh, then, and then came COVID. It seems that the Chinese activities in El Salvador are, are a period of, of a pause, or at least they are not visible, but care and concern needs to be paid to that. And, and the last concern that I have is the political environment in El Salvador. We, what I found while I had, during my delightful six years, in El Salvador was the projects such as education, training, youth development, those worked very well. But any project involving checking corruption, increasing responsibility for transparency and good governance met with opposition with either influential sectors of society or from the political parties. So um, we need to be very careful as to how these uh, challenges are managed, because especially for the United States, it is very clear that at least during the next four years, transparency, accountability, and good governance are going to be the North Star. And, and we need to be able to manage and insist on on doing the right thing and with that i thank you cindy for the opportunity um thank you uh, mari carmen um i think we've lost francisco uh, i hope he can rejoin uh the zoom link because we do have a question about foreign investment um we have um a number of questions um, a lot that have come in and we'll try to, in the time we have, try to get to them. I'll start with one uh, for Claudio Magna. Um, and the, uh, the question has to do with, um, it's clear that Bukele has weakened democratic institutions since taking office, but as Ambassador Aponte was just uh, indicating, wouldn't removing him from office prior to the upcoming elections put the country in a more dire constitutional crisis. So let's start with that, Claudia. Yes, um, thank you, Cindy. Well, first of all, let me tell you that it's a constitutional process. I mean, it does exist in our legal framework um, and it's initiating. It is very complicated because the opportunity of such a political action can be very, very complicated due to the, um, I would say, this very inflammatory um, environment that we have. It's a very political tense moment in El Salvador. So um, I would take on ambassador's uh, words of prudence. So even though it's legal, I don't know about the political convenience of that. And I don't know, it, it, it's up to Congress uh, to figure that one out. But um, I would also like to address another theme that was not touched upon. And that is the reforming of our constitution. I think that's also a very delicate theme that it's you know, it's one of those things that keeps popping up, but in general, it doesn't really have all the attention. But once we have a new Congress, it will gather more attention. I am particularly um, preoccupied because this government has systematically been violating um, fundamental rights and has not been very respectful of our Supreme Court. So, being in the executive branch, the one that's organizing these discussions, 
I also think that that's very worrisome, especially because some of the topics, topics that are being discussed is to extend presidential periods or even giving um, a political role to the military. So that's an area also to look um, in, in, the, in the future, just to watch it, observe it, and um, put more words of wisdom around it. And then the third theme that, I, a theme that I wanted to comment is also addressing the theme of transparency and the fight against corruption. I vehemently believe that if El Salvador is not able to break down on this vicious cycle of corruption, then the society becoming very disenfranchised with politics and that um, breaks down just the democratic fiber of our country. So I am very, very glad that impunity and the fight against corruption, but most of all, not regressing on transparency. Uh, I've, be, I've been working with the theme of transparency for many years and the Bukele government has done in a very quick time, a very, very um, opaque government. And he is also destroying a very important tool that was the Institute for Transparency, which it had been working very professionally. And because of his influence that um, that organization right now is not being as effective as it used to be. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. I think if Francisco can hear um, uh, a question for you, how have corruption scandals and the lack of transparency affected foreign direct investment in El Salvador? Yes, I can hear you, uh, Cindy. I'm, I'm concerned that the, my internet goes on and off, so I'll try and answer that. I'm not sure I can answer that correctly, but I can certainly talk about foreign investment. And foreign investment means talking about local investment. Both of them need confidence, transparency, and clarity on the rules of the game. Corruption and bureaucratic hangups are the enemies of that. Now, for example, I mentioned before, Uh, Francisco, we've lost, excuse me, we've lost your audio. Um, perhaps if you could uh, uh, turn off your camera, we might be able to just hear you speaking. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I was, I was disconnected again. Exactly. I, I was saying- if you could, No, no, excuse me. If you could turn off your camera, it might improve the audio, just the audio connection. Okay. Thank you. I, as I was saying, clarity, and, and respect are important for foreign investment as well for local investment. President Bukele unfortunately took aim at the Siman group and especially at the leader of the private enterprise associations, seeing in him a political rival and accused them offhandedly and violently of, of not paying taxes of more than $250 million. That's uh, bitten twice shy. Uh, foreign investors and local investors take serious note of things like that. It could happen to me tomorrow. So we've lost confidence in the word of this government. And as Ruben so clearly pointed out in the personal integrity of the president who's arrogated all power in himself, the institutions that should protect investment and foment jobs simply are not working. Francisco, thank you. Um, there, there is a, uh, uh, a question from Tiziano Breda, who is the Central America analyst at uh, the International Crisis Group. And the question is that um, uh, Nuevas Ideas will obtain more votes in the assembly than in the municipal elections. How will the relations therefore between the central and local government change? And then um, what can foreign partners do to prevent an authoritarian drift? So if someone wants to take the first part of the question um, about the um, um, assembly versus municipal elections, 
And then the other part of the question about what can the international community basically do? Um, I think Ambassador Aponte gave us some indications um, of where the Biden administration is going if people have other thoughts. Anyone want to take that question? Uh, Ruben, you're you're muted. If you were going to start to speak, you need to unmute your your uh, microphone. There you go. Como varias preguntas, verdad? Solo me referiría a una. Okay, in English, please. In English. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I am used to speak Spanish, <laughs> but I forgot that I am in a. All right, language. you're fine. All right, sorry. No, no, what I want to say is about the question of uh, the new ideas party, nuevas ide ideas, yeah? Look, if they win enough seat to control the National Assembly, might that be that way by the number of members of Congress that they is elected for them, or what is more probable, because they have two other parties, Ghana, that is an ex party, or ex, ex, ex party, and uh, CD, so two parties that are supporting the government. The important thing here is to look at the campaign that is going on in El Salvador on the way that Ghana and, and Nueva, New Ideas. And it's a campaign, a campaign made by the president. That will be not so difficult for in the United States because you have the possibility for re-elections and therefore the president has to make campaigns, of course, right? But in El Salvador, re-election is absolutely forbidden from one to the next, you know? And it, that's why the constitution is very, very strong prohibiting any member of, 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 the, of the government to support a specific political party. Let me read a little bit my translation of the article 218 of our constitution. It says clearly, yeah? Functionaries and public employees are at the service of the state and not to any political determinant fractions. No, they cannot could use their, 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 their quality yeah, in order to do political in favor of a single party. The president Bukele is doing and being the most important factor in the propaganda of the New Ideas Party. And this is the violation of the constitution. And I just give you one, and I can, I have a, something like something like seven or eight that are clearly, huh? and that's why it's a campaign besides that, that the, the center of their, of their proposal is to say, not to say about what they are going to do with the assembly, but to say simp simply that they want to support the president from the assembly, you see, if they win the, the assembly. It's absolutely clear Then the idea is to concentrate the whole power in the country, in the hands of the executive. And it is something that destroys democracy is that because this is dictatorship. Uh, thank you, Ruben. There's a, a question for Sarah Maslin who mentioned the perceptions um, of corruption um, uh, contributing to, uh, or, or how about investigations of corruption contributing to an increased uh, perception of, of corruption? Um, how can um, these investigations uh, get underway without negatively contributing to the public's view of the government? Okay, I'll, I'll give this a shot and, and please others feel free to, to weigh in as well. Um, I mean, I guess there's a, there's a couple things here. I mean, one thing that's, that's really important is the kind of um, 
legal and structural changes that give uh, police and prosecutors more and better tools to, um, to, to pursue corruption. And so, you know, after some of these allegations come out, um, movements to, you know, to make it easier to, to pursue, um, you know, not only uh, Tony Saka embezzling hundreds of millions of dollars, but also, um, you know, other cases that perhaps are, um, you know, smaller, but still important, or uh, might not kind of come out as blatantly. Um, and then also reforms that strip unreasonable protections and privileges from politicians and, uh, and, and to start to give you know, the public a sense that, um, that impunity is, is being tackled uh, for, you know, for everyone, including the most kind of elite members of, of the parties. And I guess, I mean, I'd like to maybe ask someone else to weigh in on, on to what extent those things have happened uh, in El Salvador, but I mean, it is striking that the Northern Triangle countries have needed outside bodies, um, you know, whether CC in Guatemala or CCS in El Salvador to, to kind of come in. And that that's a good thing. I mean, it, it means that they are kind of one step closer to being able to do it themselves, but um, it takes time and, and we haven't gotten there yet. So I think, um, you know, getting the ability to, to do the sorts of things uh, you know, that, that CC has been able to help with in Guatemala or CCS is helping with in El Salvador. Um, and, I, and I have heard that there's a proposal in the legislature in El Salvador to give CCS more independence and, uh, you know, start moving in that, that direction. I mean, I guess the only other thing I would just mention really quickly is, I mean, there, there's been a, a kind of a debate about to what extent the, you know, the lack of justice from some of the historical cases going back to the war has kind of contributed to, you know, impunity about corruption. And I guess the connection isn't direct, but I do think it's an interesting debate about, you know, whether the priority should be on corruption and gangs now, or whether the justice system should also be returning and looking at some of the old cases like El Mosote, um, and whether kind of solving impunity for, for historical cases could help um, with some of the problems at present as well. Sarah, thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, journalist Carmen Rodriguez uh, for Ambassador Aponte, which is, you know, if um, if active government officials uh, ha wind up on this angle list, how is that going to affect relations uh, between Salvador and the United States? Well, we are going to have to work through that. I I think that. Uh, it is what it is, and the names that land on that angle list, I am sure will land there because there is a basis. Um, it is not going to be for political or, 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 or even ideological reasons. And there, there it is, it will probably uh, cause some uh, tension and some friction but conversation and seeking of a goal that is good for both countries should be our guiding light. Thank you, uh, Mari Carmen. Um, there's a question from Damian Merlo um, about the perceived impartiality of the Electoral Council, including the failure to transmit results. This is worrisome. Can Does anyone want to comment on um, the uh, even-handedness of the uh, Supreme Electoral Tribunal and the degree to which the public can have confidence in that institution. I can try to answer a little bit, Cindy. Um, one of the institutions that had a lot of credibility since the signing of the peace accord has been our Tribunal Supremo Electoral, which is the electoral tribunal, that it, it has been basically very good at administering the election, very bad at being a tribunal because they have not been very strong with political parties. And needless to say, right now, it has been very, very soft on putting, you know, at least restricting the, the time periods where politics is allowed. 
but let me go to the to the um, elections. Every tribunal is trying to push modern practices. El Salvador's uh, electoral process, it's still very cumbersome. You get these big pages and, and just trying to figure it out by because of all the, the faces there are in, in those big uh, printed pages, it's, it's kind of difficult. And one of the theme is how to alleviate some of the tension of waiting for the results, you know, when people have all these emotions. So they decided some time ago that they should have some, uh, some uh, technological advances in the sense that they wouldn't do like an extra paperwork, but they would try to punch in in a computer the results of each table, electoral table. But for that, you need um, internet and electricity. The executive um, is a branch is giving schools, many schools, so that that process can be done. In the first, um, a, in the first tryout, there were difficulties. So I really hope that they start working on that because something that is, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's a technical process should be worked upon and it should come out okay. What would be very, very difficult right now, it's saying throw away all that has been organized and let's go back to paper because I believe they don't have the time any, anymore to print everything out and to organize in a different matter. So um, I think it's, it's partly just being efficient in doing it the right way. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm gonna ask one last question, but then ask each of you if you'd like to make 30 to 60 seconds of final comments um, in the time remaining. Um, the final question is for Ruben Zamora. It's from Jesse Acevedo, a professor at the University of Denver, who asks about what the party system in El Salvador will look like in the next few electoral cycles. Put on your prediction. It is, it is very difficult to predict, and I am very, against predictions in politics, especially elections, you know, I had too many examples of being wrong. But in that sense, I think that the assembly is going to change. The presence of members of the New Ideas Party is going to be there. Yeah. And probably in the first place, probably in the first place. Are they going to have the majority? This is the question right now. Why? Because in El Salvador, la, the tradition is that no party has been able to have the majority by himself in, in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, because our system is different from the United States. It's a system of proportional representation. And we don't have a small, as you have a small for, for, for your country, a different district, but it's the, the, the department, the department of the Republic, the one that has the, the, the election. That, that's why it's a completely different, but probably, of course, yeah, new ideas are going to be there, no doubt about that. How much, this is what nobody knows. And especially now that because the pandemic, because the intents and so many other things that people are some fear to express their, their, what they want to do, still there is more, something like 28% of the people who say that they are going to vote that don't want to say for whom they are going to vote. And this is just an indicator. But then the question is, are they going to have the majority First, the simple majority that is alpha plus one, or the special majority that is no less than two thirds of the members, that has the key one because is the, they are the election for the Supreme Court of Justice, for the Attorney General, for the Human Rights Protector, for the body that control the money 
that how the the functionary deal with the money of El Salvador, the, the government money, you know, all those people, that mean all the second level of the government depends on the, how many people are in the assembly. And that's why it's so important, uh, first, to, to have a clear in, um, and clean elections. Why? Because the president of El Salvador, President Bukele, I can see following Mr. Trump in, the, in your country, yeah, has been the one that have started to say that there is going to be a fraud in the election and that this election is going to be fraudulent. We have been used for the last 30 years in accepting the result of the, of the, of the elections. No discussion about that. Of course, cases are as any other cases, but the role of the election as a whole was accepted for all the parties. This is the first time in more than 30 years that a, a party and a, a, who is a president of the Republic that put in question the election. Why he is doing that is very difficult to answer. Ruben, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time. Uh, we can ask for one final comment from each of you if you feel that there is something you would like to say that you have not yet had a chance uh, to add. Please don't repeat things that you've already laid out so eloquently. I see Francisco with his hand up. You're not obliged, uh, Ambassador Aponte, Sarah. Okay, so we'll start with Francisco, go ahead. Unfortunately, unfortunately, my internet connection is from the medieval ages. I think we need to say that we understand fully that as a society, we have failed our population, despite the great triumphs of the peace accords. It is unmentionable that President Bukele disowns the whole history that was created again for El Salvador after the peace accords. All I would ask is that the people who have been hearing us, and certainly Sarah, who has joined us today, believe that we can pull through this one. It is our problem and we will pull through it. We've shown it before. We've shown it in earthquakes, in hurricanes, in revolutions. Salvador always finds a way to come across. Those are my last thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Mari Carmen and Sarah. Um, I think that uh, President Bukele and his party will get them a, a majority in the upcoming elections. I am very happy that the United States decided to elect a centrist, reasonable president because it is going to take, if the strategy of the United States is going to be successful in El Salvador and in the Northern Triangle, it's going to take that kind of precedent to implement it and, and make it successful. Okay, Sarah, please. Sure, um, I'll be quick. I mean, we spent a lot of time speaking about uh, political parties, but I, I guess I just wanted to mention kind of the important role that civil society has here and, and going forward. And um, I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, why you didn't see the kind of protests that you saw in Guatemala in El Salvador. And, and one sort of explanation is that, you know, the, the, the two parties were so polarized that civil society kind of split as well with the business community on one side and then sort of you know, more kind of civil society and NGO groups on the other. And I think in the past few years, um, one positive side of the, you know, disillusion with the parties is that there's been much more independence uh, in the media and, and in, in civil society groups and business groups. And that's going to be a really, really important resource and shield uh, going forward. So um, people aren't helpless uh, and, and um, you know, thank you very much for having me and um, watching closely from here in Brazil. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Claudia, Ruben, do you have a final comment? I, no, I no, would... need to, no need to go in. Otherwise, Claudia? Yes. Um, building up on what Sarah said, 
I have been part of many groups of civil society and the way the civil society of El Salvador is structured, it's, we have so many diverse um, causes, but we are very joined by our democratic values. And I think that that is a treasure that El Salvador has, the capacity to join at very important moments. And so if we, if we in the next year put together that force of the civil society, but in specific plans that has to do with good governance, um, transparency, the fight against corruption, also opportunities, uh, I think that we can come through. So I would like to end uh, on a positive note and say that also this alliance that we have with civil society of the United States, like the Woodrow Wilson, just letting us share our stories and see that uh, we have many areas in common. Uh, we are all fighting for democracy. It's not an easy time in this age. Thank you. Great, I'm tempted to end there, but Ruben, you have your hand up. So please unmute and, and you'll have the final word. Well, I want to say, yes, first, it could look very dark, our panorama, but there is something that now is re, redeveloping, that is civil society. I never in my long life in politics has seen a pronounce, a public pronounce discourse hmm, in all the newspapers signed for nearly 200 people in which you can see the most rich people, the biggest empresarios of the country, hmm, with other people like me that we don't have for, almost no, no, nothing, and historians and everybody. This is new in El Salvador. Hmm? And this is our hope. But for that hope to become reality, we need that in these elections, the United States government and civil society of the United States would help with the question of look at the elections and sending observers. This is very important for us. Thank you. Great, Ruben, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Aponte, Claudia, Sarah, Francisco, Ruben. This has been a very rich conversation. We'll obviously be watching closely what happens on February 28th. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to the audience for bearing with us through this process. Um, the uh, uh, Ambassador Mayorga will be submitting her written comments. We'll post those on the web. Any of you who also have written comments that you would permit us uh, to add to the website, we'd be very grateful. Thank you so much. Be well, stay healthy.